Uh, I think in the next three or four weeks, we're probably going to wrap this series up because we really never wrap anything up around here. What we do is we change titles and we keep talking about the goodness of God. We keep talking about, you know, having a, having a fuller uh, revelation of our Father's goodness and of his love for all of mankind and so on. But, um, but anyway, this week, uh, uh, we are going to be kind of uh, laying some groundwork for uh, actually the, 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 uh, the, the, what I want to communicate this week is actually going to be better communicated in the next two weeks, but I'm going to uh, establish some foundation this week for it. But I'd like for you to open your Bibles with me this morning, first of all, to the eighth chapter of the Gospel of John. And uh, if you have a Bible, you, you may want to use it today because I don't know if we'll be able to keep up from the screen later on because I'm going to be running a lot of scriptures. But um, <clears throat> John 8, 44, or actually I'm going to start with verse 42. And I'm not really going to comment on this at the moment. I'm going to read it, and then we're going to move into some things, and we'll be referring back to this. Uh, but I want you to see, the, see it before we go on. Then Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie or a deception, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of liars. Now, as I said, I'm not going to comment on that now, but it'll, be, it'll become important to you later on this morning. But, you know, whatever is misinterpreted in a relationship really jeopardizes that relationship. I've talked, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about, uh, you know, some, uh, an instance in our, in, in our early marriage when uh, we were in a counseling session and Marilyn said something and, and I responded uh, just really out of sorts. And the counselor that we were with uh, stopped the whole converse, conversation and said, uh, Mike, what did you hear when she said what she did? And because uh, he and his wife had heard something entirely different than what I heard, even though we all both heard the same English words, you know. And so I talked about that a little bit before. But you see, what happens is whatever is misinterpreted in a relationship jeopardizes that relationship. Isn't that right? It kind of, it, uh, it, you know, it, it, it undermines the sense of security that people have and it, and it detracts from the, the fellowship and the joy of that relationship. And in the same way, whatever is misinterpreted, misunderstood about, uh, about our Heavenly Father is also going to jeopardize your uh, sense of relationship with the Father. Obviously, it's not going to change anything where God is concerned, but it's going to exert a negative effect, you know, on your experience of the Father's love and of His grace. And this is why, you know, uh, I've taken so long with this subject of what about the judgment of God. Um, and yet, you know, nevertheless, there, there, are, there are some passages of Scripture that I'm aware of uh, in the New Testament that are causing some of you problems. There, there are passages of Scripture that are kind of keeping you from really, that you can't quite move past them. You're having difficulty moving past them. And um, some of those things, boy, this thing is really out of sorts up here today. I don't know what it is. But there's these passages of Scripture that, that continue to trouble you, and they trouble you primarily because, and listen to me carefully, because whether you've think, thought about it or not, you have been victimized. You have been victimized by, by what I'm going to call recent uh, eschatological thinking and by a, by a process that uh, we're going to kind of try to identify over the next couple of weeks, you know, that, that, has, that has filled the eschatologies of the church with fear tactics. Because what is eschatology about? It's about, the, it's, it's about the doctrines of the end, but the recent eschatologies have been based upon fear, uh, the fear of judgment and wrath and so on and so forth. And so many of these scriptures that are, have become problem texts for people, I've discovered are really only problem texts because of the influence that fear eschatology has had upon people. And by that I mean the late great planet Earth, the left behind, those kind of things, the John Hagee type of stuff. You know, and again, I'm not against any of these men. I know that they're, you know, just, they think they're doing the right thing. And, uh, but, but the thing is, their eschatologies have had a tremendous effect upon the uh, upon this whole concept of, of the goodness of God it's, it, it's had repercussions in all these areas but here's the thing see whatever keeps retribution and punitive um, you know what do I want to say punitive um, judgment whatever keeps these things lurking in the dark recesses of your mind <laughs> 
You know, whatever is out there that can keep the retribution kind of lurking in the back, uh, in the dark recesses of your mind is going to have a negative effect on your experience with the goodness of God because it's going to cast a bad light upon that. And you see, most people that I deal with and talk to, I mean, many people I've talked to even as we've done this series, are people who still have this thing that keeps coming up or, or several things that, that, that keep kind of poking its head out of, of the dark recesses of their mind. And so, you know, a lot of that has to do, as I said, with the, uh, with the, with the idea or with the fact that some of our, I'm going to call them apocalyptic prophets of today, you know, uh, the, the way they have, what do I want to say, I, I, the way they have just communicated fear to the body of Christ and through the body of Christ to the world. The world wouldn't have the fears that they have if the body of Christ hadn't given them those fears. See? Now, you're un for instance, you know, you're undoubtedly aware, you know, of, you know, many of the so-called grace ministries that uh, are, you know, have a ministry of grace, <laughs> a ministry of grace that is predicated upon your response. You know what I'm saying? In other words, they minister a grace that Paul would say in Romans 11:6 6 is no longer grace at all. And yet it's deemed, it's called grace. Well, you see, and, and then I know that some of you are certainly aware of the fact that there are many grace professing people out there who still have man, somehow managed to hang on to the idea that the answer for violence is more violence. See, that the way we respond to violence is, is through violence. And that God has, is okay with that, see? But here's the thing I want to get to. I don't want to preach on that right now because I think probably later on we'll... I, I hope that through this series where we've been so far, you've already begun to realize that, that, uh, that violence is off the table. Well, we, we saw the guy, how God took old te the Old Testament understanding of what the, what the Hebrews thought about the judgment of God. He took that off the table. He took wrath off the table. He took anger off the table. He took those things and dismissed them from any further conversation. He did not agree with the conversation that had taken place prior to this, this, this moment in Isaiah 54 when he took them off the table. But, but, he, but he was very clear that he's not even going to entertain that conversation anymore. That conversation that had been built upon their mythology was no longer going to even be allowed to, to, to exist between him and his man. You see, in the past, he had allowed it to be there. He had allowed them to, to think those things. And now he starts taking things off the table. He starts trying to clean up things so that they don't have the same expectations of him that they've had down through the ages until that time. So, and anyway, so we, we've, got these, we've got these grace discrepancies is what I call them out there. People that are, uh, uh, that are or ministries that are proclaiming what they call a grace message. And yet there's a tremendous discrepancy if you look at their message in light of what you're beginning to understand about grace. You see, we cannot say that uh, this is what you must do in order to be and call that grace. We can't say it's by the grace of God if. See what I'm saying? We can't say that. We can't say that it's okay to have an eye for an eye mentality and call yourself a grace you know, believer. We've got to make some changes. It's okay to say, I believe in an eye for an eye, if that's what you want to believe in. It's okay, you know, it's okay to be uh, all, all, up in, all up in arms, <laughs> if you want to be. I'm not, I'm not uh, telling you not to be. I'm just saying, don't call yourself a grace believer. Don't say that you are established in a revelation of the grace of God, because a revelation of the grace of God, is, you know, takes away all of our what you must do to bees. Takes all that away, right? And, and, it, and it takes away the idea that I can have an eye for an eye response to the world around me. Because Jesus said, you know, Matthew 5, 38, I think, you know, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, and who is it that interprets the Bible for us? Jesus. Jesus. Where was it said? Well, it was said in the Old Testament. You have heard that it was said in the Old Testament. <laughs> but I say unto you, all right? So these are grace discrepancies. That's what I'm talking about. And here's the thing I want to get to, though. At the root of all these grace discrepancies is the assumption of some form of divine retribution. You know what I'm saying? Whether it's separation or what they call eternal conscious torment or what some theologians would call annihilationism, extermination, extermination. 
See, there's, there, there, are, there are a variety of beliefs that are all based upon some divine retribution. There are people who believe in an eternal separation from God, see, but they don't go so far as to say eternal conscious torment, everybody alive and burning in hell and screaming, right? But what they'd rather do then is say, well, because we don't believe God would do that, he's just going to wipe them all out in one swift move. Poof, annihilationism, see? But you see, I want you to realize that all of these grace discrepancies have at their root some idea of a God who has a, let me look, look up here, has a just, <laughs> uses a just violence in order to satisfy his own ends whether it be the violence of murdering his own son in favor of humanity, right? Or whether it might be the extermination and the, the execution, you know, of untold millions who simply failed to RSVP his, uh, his invitation, right? Think about it. I think we're getting a better idea of things. And I know that this really, you know, crosses some boundaries for you, but... <laughs> That's what my job is. Cross boundaries. Go places we've never been before. This is what I asked the Father and the Holy Spirit to do with me and have been asking for almost 40 years. Go places I've never been before. Take me places. Make me ask questions that I've never thought to ask. Put those questions in my heart and give me no peace until I ask them of you. And when I ask them of you, I know I can trust you to begin to lead me in the way of the answer. Not to have an immediate full revelation, but to lead me in the way of your answer, the answer that you want me to have. Not, not just so I can communicate it to others, but first and foremost, so that I can live within it. See, a lot of times preachers just preach, you know, to, to, to the masses. But I want every message to be preached in me and to become a part of my life before I even begin to share it with people. See, that, because that's really what matters to me, is, is, is what I understand of God. And I try to pass that on, but it's not because I'm doing this as a profession. I'm just passing it on because it's so good and so rich in my life. When it becomes good and rich in my life, then I want to share it with somebody. Isn't that right? So I'm not, I'm not trying to lead you down a path uh, of speculation. I'm not trying to put things before you that I think, well, could possibly be true. Uh, and I'm also not, on the other hand, trying to say I have all the truth. That, I, that this is the way it is and it can't be any other way because as I've told you before, about every three years I have to go back through my old teachings and say, whoops. I got to take that one out of the archive. <laughs> you know? Well, anyway. <clears throat> but the Christian problem with all of this, I'm talking about, you know, these, 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 uh, these grace discrepancies, the Christian problem in all this, the Christian problem in being able to uh, and in, in, in still understanding or having lurking in the, in the dark shadows of your mind, you know, a retributive God. The Christian problem really is, is, the, is the problem texts, the problem scriptures, and what you do with them. Now, everybody, I, I've, I've discovered that there are a couple of common problem texts it seemed to be very common because I'm hearing about them from people that are making requests on email to me and, and, and people that have sat here in the church. And then there are some others that seem to be just uh, isolated and specific to certain individuals and, be, and based on your background, I think. But, but anyway, the, the root of the problem for Christians is these problem texts and, and how you have been able to deal with them or unable to deal with them, right? And I've got to say this, it never ceases to amaze me you know, how quickly some people can reject or dismiss the great body of truth, you know, in the face of a few seemingly, and I emphasize that word, seemingly contradictory verses. You understand what I'm saying? It never ceases to amaze me how people can take, and see, my journey, this, my purpose in this journey we've been taking is to present to you the huge body of, con of, of evidence contrary to what the church has, has believed about the judgment of God in an effort or in hopes of, you know, silencing the voices of those minority, seemingly contradictory texts. See, because if you get, a, my, my thought is that if you get enough revelation or enough body of evidence that pretty soon you will be able to look at a certain scripture or two that you have been taught to see a certain way, and you'll be able to 
dismiss it without any problem. Now, in other words, when I say dismiss it, I'm not talking about dismissing scripture. I'm talking about dismissing the, the meaning that you were told it had. Yeah. Say, well, I can't mean that. I don't know what it means, but it can't mean that. Why can't it mean that? Because you see, over here on this side, I have so heavily weighted the scales with the revelation of God's goodness and with the contrary evidence to the punitive, retributive judgment and wrath and vengeance of God. I have so heavily weighted this scale that that can't possibly be true. Now, I find it recorded in my Bible, and so I'm going to give the Holy Spirit as much time as he wants to show me what that passage might mean. You hear what I'm saying? So we're not discount. I never discount scripture. What I do, and I know there's a lot of people that do, a lot of people that would suggest that you just throw it out, cut that piece out, you know, take that verse out, you know, cut your Bible all up in little pieces or something and just glue it back together the way you want it, you know. You wouldn't have any of the verses from Leviticus, of course, and you wouldn't have anything from Revelation, and you wouldn't have, <laughs> there's a lot of things, you know, and, and maybe that might be profitable for people for a little while, I don't know. But anyway, but remember this. Because most of us know this, we all see things, you know, from the perspective that has, we have been programmed to see it from. Isn't that right? And that is absolutely true of these so-called problem texts. We each one see the problem texts, you know, uh, <laughs> the way we've been primed and programmed to see them. I've got a little funny story here about a friend, and I'm not going to use the person's name, but Marilyn and I heard this and, uh, a few years ago. We have a, a female friend down south who had gone on an African safari. And on this African safari, they were going to go out one day and they were going to go to a park that was supposed to be uh, heavily saturated with cheetahs. And they were going to go out and see the cheetahs. And so they were in a tour bus. And as they toured around through this particular portion of, uh, I don't know which park it was they were in in Africa, but as they, um, th they were looking for cheetahs. Well, then suddenly the guide pointed out and said, there, 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 there's the cheetahs, there's the cheetahs out there, out there. And, and this lady, her head went up and she was looking up. She said, I don't see any cheetahs. There's no cheetahs. <laughs> now, some of you already know this lady was probably about our age and probably, now you probably don't know this, but, and, and, and had been heavily influenced by the name of Tarzan's monkey, cheetah. And so she thought that cheetahs lived in trees. See? So <laughs> that's just a, you know, but, but you see, that's the thing that happens. I mean, how, how ridiculous is that when you think about it? I mean, I'm not being, saying she's ridiculous, but, but how, how, how funny is that when you think about it? Just the influence of Tarzan's monkey had such an influence on this lady's perception of things that she expected to see cheetahs up in the trees, not as cats on the ground. See? Well, you see, we all have a tendency to see things the way we've been primed and programmed. Isn't that right? Okay. And one of the problems that we have is that our, you know, our modern apocalyptic prognosticators, uh, you know, the, our, our prophets of the... Of the <laughs> of the end times, our prophets of the end times. Now listen to me carefully, because this is what we're going to be getting into. They have hijacked the contextual settings of the words of Jesus, and they have relocated them to a time that is yet future to us. That makes sense to you? They've taken the words of Jesus that were spoken and intended in a particular time frame, and they have hijacked those and said, now we're going to put these over here, see, in a time frame that is yet future to us today. Now, as they've done that, what's happened is then they have necessarily, you know, or they have made it necessary, I should say, to also relocate Paul's words so that Paul's words will confirm the words of Jesus. In other words, when they read a text, they say this text then confirms this from Jesus, right? But because they have relocated the, 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 the text of Jesus, because they have taken it and put it in a time frame that it was not intended to be in, they now must line up, bring alongside the texts that exist that were written by the apostles that seem to, or that, that apply in the same thing. Does that make sense to you, what I'm saying? Okay. Now, 
So what we're going to do is, you can just back up into John chapter 6 for a minute. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to, we're going to start out by looking briefly at uh, two quick scriptures here that highlight a, a typical confusion that exists as a result of modern contextual, you know, relocation. I'm going to call it contextual relocation. And that'll become clear to you. I know that it might sound like a kind of a off the wall thing now. But l l let's look at uh, verse 40, 640. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And then if you look at verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, here's all I want to ask right now about these two pieces of Scripture. I want to ask you this. <clears throat> what did Jesus envision here? In other words, what did the last day mean to Jesus then? When Jesus said, I will raise him up in the last day, what did that mean to Jesus then? Not what does it mean to us, not what do we think it means today, but what did it actually mean to Jesus then when he said, I will raise him up in that last day? All right? <clears throat> Let me ask it this way. When did he foresee this day coming to pass? Now, here's the interesting thing about this. I'm not going to answer this question this week. <laughs> You're going to have to come back next week. Yeah. <laughs> to be continued. No, no. But what we're going to do today, though, is we're going to begin to help you deal with this next week. I'm just using this because this is one of those passages of Scripture, you know, that. Well, in fact, uh, five times it is written that Jesus said in the last day. Three times it is written that Jesus said, in that day. All right, so we have that. Um, most of those are in John, by the way. But <clears throat> so these eight times, Jesus said either in the last day or in that day. All right. Now, these have become confusing scriptures for people in light of what we're talking about. Okay. Simply because we don't know. We don't know the vision of Jesus in his ministry. In his earthly ministry, we don't understand the immediate focus of his words and thoughts. And we don't realize the context in which he spoke and the vision that he had from that perspective. Now, this is all going to become clear to you, but I'm laying out some things now that I want that are so very important. In other words, it's essential that we recognize the setting and the targeted audience of Jesus's words. It's essential. Now, this will help you begin to see what I'm talking about. Go with me to Matthew chapter 10. Verse 5. Because as I said, a big part of the problem that we have with these problem texts as they pertain to the judgment, the wrath, the vengeance of God... There's problem texts that apply to a lot of things, uh, you know, but, but I'm, we're dealing with what we're dealing with. A big part of the problem we have is that there has been a, a great deal of contextual relocation from the intended location to a future location that was not intended for it to be built upon that property. Okay. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. That these 12 Jesus sent out, commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles or the nations, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, if you'd go with me over to chapter 15, verses 24 and 26, we're going to look at. And he says to the Canaanite woman, I was not sent. Everybody say, Not sent. Not sent. I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Verse 26. It is not good. Say, say not good. It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Okay. Now, based on what we've just read, could we say this? Could we say that the nations or the Gentiles and the Samaritans weren't the immediate focus or the context of his thoughts, words, and actions? Yes. Absolutely. He just told us the immediate focus, the immediate context of his thoughts, words, and actions was the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he made it clear that they were not to go to the nations. They were not to go to the Gentiles, that that's not where his ministry was directed. That was not the vision of his ministry at this point in time. 
See what I'm saying? So what are we seeing already? We're seeing a context being established for his words, aren't we? Who's going to be the, who's going to be the recipients or the targeted audience of his words? <laughs> the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Correct? Okay. <clears throat> now we know that you know, his commission to these disciples changed after his resurrection. We know that. But that's not what we're looking for now. What we're looking for now, and you'll see, understand why as we go, what we're looking for now is the target audience of his words prior to his crucifixion. Is that right? Okay. And the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke in particular, but John as well, the gospel writers reveal a common focus and a perspective with Jesus. In other words, they express in their writings their understanding of his vision, his words, and his actions. And this is important to us because, okay, most of our eschatology, most of our apocalyptic expectation has been drawn from the words of Jesus in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Now, if you're familiar with Matthew 24, really all I've done is tell you that Mark 13 and Luke 21 are basically, you know, the same thing uh, written by these writers, Right. And now these are the passages of scriptures. And again, I'm not trying to be, please don't take me as trying to be uh, uh, discrediting of other men in their ministries. But these are the three passages of scripture that Hal Lindsey and Tim LaHaye absolutely depended upon in order to be able to go over and give us their interpretation of revelation. So you see, our, eschat uh, our eschatological uh, thoughts, you know, and our, our, our last day's doctrine, so to speak, are all rooted in the words of Jesus and the context, uh, you know, and, and what's happened is we, we see in book after book after book, the contextual relocation of Mark, Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. We see it being <laughs> where Jesus has just told us, I'm sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, right? And now we find out that we've been told that, that the things that he said to the lost sheep of the house of Israel in Matthew, Mark, and Luke were actually for us today, right? I'm just giving you some hints right now, okay? All right. <clears throat> so really what I want to do is, I, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm using this week as a setup week for the next two weeks, but we're, you're going to pick up some nuggets along the way. We're going to, you know, uh, pick up some extra insights today that we will actually enlarge upon in the next couple of weeks. But for right now, we're looking for one thing and one thing in particular because there is one thing in particular that will help us positively identify the target audience. I mean, beyond what we've already seen in Matthew 10 and Matthew 15. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to repetitiously <laughs> scan a bunch of scripture here over the next few minutes, looking for this one thing, pointing out this one thing that is so very important for us to isolate, you know, in order to accommodate what we need to be able to, to see today, all right? Now, first thing we're going to do is we're going to take one look at John the Baptist, and then we're going to proceed into just listening to Jesus. We're going to go to John the Baptist, Matthew chapter 3, and verse 7. Are you following me so far? Because I know this is a little bit tedious, maybe, but it's necessary that we wade through this today in order to kind of set the stage uh, please keep in the back of your mind what I said earlier, okay? Uh, what did I say earlier? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> what did Jesus mean when he referred to the last day? When did he foresee that day being fulfilled, okay? Because that's one of the things that's going to be very big in our message next week. Um, but anyhow... <clears throat> All right, John chapter 3, I mean Matthew chapter 3 and verse 7. But when John saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, this is kind of a side note, but it's not. When we consider John the Baptist, one of the things that we must do with John the Baptist uh, and I think I suggested this previously with regard to the Old Testament prophets, we must understand that John, <laughs> more often than not, had a very valid and true word from the Lord in his heart. We're told in Luke, the word of the Lord came unto John in the wilderness. All right, so let me say that again. We, we need to approach John with the understanding that, that he had 
uh, more often than not, a, a, a true word from the Lord in red letters, word from the Lord in his heart, right? But his, his um, mythological frame of reference necessarily interpreted that word differently than from the, quite differently than from what the word intended. Now, we, we see those things. We see some of those things when we see the, the way he introduces Jesus and then his consternation in the fact that Jesus isn't cleaning things up with fire and brimstone. He said, going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He had his own understanding of fire. All right? So we see that. We see that John has a word from the Lord, but his mythological frame of reference, the Old Testament comprehension of who God was and the way God dealt and the way Elijah brought down fire if necessary and so on and so forth, that Old Testament frame of reference or that mythological reference that he had of God, you know, this allowed him to interpret that, really, in light of the truth of what that word intended. Could that happen today? Oh, my gosh, it happens all the time today. People get a word from the Lord. Say, I, I give me, let me give you another little example. And this is not a, not a really strong example, but years and years and years ago, uh, we were in a, 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 a common citywide worship service, and there were several pastors there, and we had a healing service at the end of the, uh, during this, and there was a, a little Hispanic woman that came up, a little blind woman that came up uh, from here in the community. And she came up and she wanted prayer for healing. Well, as I began to lay hands on her to pray for her, her pastor, who was also a Hisp Hispanic gentleman, uh, came up and, and he whispered in my ear. And this was a, <laughs> it, it, when, he, when he whispered in my ear, it kind of shook me because of the age of this woman. She was older than I am now. And he said, uh, she's, um, she's in an adulterous affair with a, with, a, with a young man in her community. She was in her 70s, <laughs> you know. And so here's the thing. So, 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 so I have this bit of truth. It's a true. It's a true thing, right? And so I can do one of two things with that. I can say, you know, Thank you, Father, for sharing that with me, because what I need to do is help this woman understand that this is not a barrier to her healing. Or I can say, well, no wonder she's blind. She can't be healed. You see what I'm saying? So one represents a response, a, a, a word response to the word, right? The other represents a mythological influence upon my thinking. Isn't that correct? Now, I'll give you some good news. I tried to tell her she was forgiven, that it had nothing to do with anything, that she could be healed. And I don't know, I don't know how it all turned out in the end. I wasn't able to follow that situation. But that's the kind of thing I'm saying. So, so here he has, John has a, a true word in his heart. And you're going to encounter John many times, and many things that he says in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, or that are recorded that he said. And you're going to understand that, that, yes, these were true words from the Lord, but you cannot allow, here's what I'm saying, you cannot allow John to participate in the development of your eschatology. And we'll see right, right now as we, as we read this again. Okay, let's read this one more time. <clears throat> Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, you see, we can do this with John's statement here. We can go ahead and allow him to participate in the construction of our eschatology. There is a wrath to come, right? All right, we can do that. And, and John is a major contributor to that kind of mentality, okay? Now, so let's look at a couple things. First of all, John says, brood of vipers. Well, that sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it? Well, this Greek word that's brood, uh, rendered brood here, the King James uses the word generation, generation of vipers, okay? Um, but it means that which has been born or begotten, brood. That which has been born or begotten. So, Here's what John is saying, whether he realizes it or not, offspring of vipers, first of all. Or we could say it this way, born of, of, of the serpent-infected fathers of our human nature, right? That's why I read John 8, you are of your father, the devil, right? You have been born of the serpent-inspired, <laughs> see, Fathers of their human nature. Or we would call it Adamic lineage. Isn't that right? 
John says brood of vipers. So in other words, who's his audience? Fallen humanity. Where are they? Everywhere at the time as he stands there, right? But I am quite sure that John, this goes back to what I said a while ago, John did not see himself in that group. John had an exclusive message in his own mind. The Spirit of the Lord inside him says, Brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, that's a word from the Lord, I'm quite sure. But John's understanding of that, I'm also quite sure, was contrary to what the Lord was trying to say. He's identifying Adamic, <laughs> you know, Adamic man, which is everybody. But John's thinking it's only these scumbags that have come out here from the IRS office. Amen. <laughs> it's another poke at Kent. I get him every week. <laughs> no. I just found out about that one, so I had to use it right away before it became... <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> no, they, but see, that's what he's saying. It's only this certain group of people. These, who is it? Sadducees and Pharisees. Now, you want know there were a lot of people out there that came out to John in the wilderness that were not Sadducees or Pharisees. But I'm quite sure that John had the Pharisees and the Sadducees only in mind, not realizing that he too was part of the very word, brood of vipers. Yeah. Isn't that right? Okay. And then he goes on and he talks to him about, you know, the wrath to come and so on and so forth. So the word in his heart was much bigger than his understanding of that word. And his communication of that word was inadequate on the one hand. But yet he spoke the word in preparation because, remember, he's preparing the way of the Lord, right? And so the other thing we need to understand then is this is why I said we cannot allow John to participate in, our, in the construction of our eschatology because his wrath to come would have been punitive. It would have been retributive. It would have been vindictive in the Hebrew line of thought. Is that right? He was saying, who warns you guys to, uh, to escape from the thunder and lightning that's about to take you out? I mean, that's his mentality, right? Okay. So his, his, his understanding or his communication of the wrath to come would not have been the orge, the restorative justice that we've learned about in Jesus Christ, the wrath of God revealed from heaven against everything that had man bound up and not in, in, in a sense of non-relational, you know, non-relationship, non-likeness, those things we've talked about. Now, obviously, you've got to draw on a lot of stuff that we've already talked about as I go through this. But so his meaning would be different than our meaning now, just based on the few weeks that we've been in this thing, right? All right. But now let's get to Jesus in his vision. Go with me to Matthew chapter 11 and verse 16. And because there's so much of this, uh, I'm going to tell you where it is repeated in other gospels. Now, there will, we will have to go to Mark and Luke for a couple of them because they're not in Matthew. But here we, we in Matthew 11:16, 16, this particular statement is also in Luke 7:31. But let's look at Matthew 11:16. Jesus said, "But to what shall I liken this generation?" At least underline those words in your mind. This generation. Okay? To what shall I liken this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their companions. I don't care what else it says right now. I'm focusing on one thing. Okay? Now, generation, here's one of the things that we think, and we've got to change our thinking a little bit. Now, we use generation, it's an appropriate way to use generation, certainly, but it's also a limited way, according from the biblical perspective. We think of generation, I'm a generation, Caleb is a generation, Caleb's children are a generation. So between, uh, between the youngest one, Liam, and me, we have three generations, me, Caleb, Caleb's boys and girls and daughter, okay? So that's the way we normally think of it. Uh, I remember when one of the books that I read uh, that I've already referred to was written, it talked about, and I don't think that this is a, an in, inaccurate thing, that a biblical generation uh, was uh, about 40 years, something like that, right? But there is a much broader, a much bigger meaning of the word generation, and we have limited it to where we can't hear it necessarily the way it's intended to be heard. So generation, th this word means all of the offspring of a common am ancestor. Now, in the analogy I just used, okay, we could, we could say the, all of the offspring of a common ancestor, you know, would be just my children and grandchildren, right, at this, at this particular stage. But it means all of them, and it also means, and you know this, generation also means the act of generating. Procreation, 
or origination. So in other words, here's what you need to hear. It, Genesis 5.1 says this. It says, identifying the book of Genesis, it says, the book of the genealogy or the generation of Adam. And then that fifth chapter goes on down through Noah, but the rest of Genesis goes clear on through Joseph. See, it just continues, carries on. The book of the genealogy, but that word in the Hebrew is just generation. The book of the generation of Adam. Now, we would say, well, there are many, 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 many generations. That's appropriate. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's not what the scripture is talking about here. Okay, so generation here refers to all, as I said here, all of the offspring of a common ancestor. Who would that common ancestor be? Well, from our biblical perspective, it would be Adam. Okay, Adam. <clears throat> so here's what I want you to understand. When Jesus says, to what shall I liken this generation? I want you to understand that Jesus is reaching back all the way to the origination of the human problem. All the way back there. <laughs> and, and he's bringing them current in the moment. And he's calling it all this generation. In other words, he's confining all of uh, Adamic heritage to one, des one designation, this generation. Is this making sense to you? Okay. Go to Matthew 12 and verse 34. Now here we see Jesus using the same words that John used. Brood of vipers. How can, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Again, I'm just focusing on a small portion right now. He says, brood of vipers. Again, he's not picking on a certain group of people. He's not picking on, you know, the adulterers, the homosexuals, the people that the church picks on. He's not picking on these people. He's using this, again, in the all-inclusive way, the John 8, 44 way. You, you know, you are of your father, the devil. And, you to, and please hear Jesus always saying these things in a, in a, in a voice of, with a voice of compassion. Not, not a finger-shaking Jesus. Not a Jesus that's stomping on the floor and, and trying to get your attention by bringing condemnation to you. So when Jesus identifies them as a brood of vipers, and he said, how can you be evil? See, again, he's not just saying some of you are evil. What he's doing is he is, he is, again, identifying the human problem. Is what he's doing right here, see? They're, they're a common issue. In other words, evil was in their heredity, not in their behavior. Yep. He's just saying, how can you be an evil? Good question. Okay. Now go to Matthew 12, 39, just later in the chapter. And this is also recorded in Luke eleven twenty nine. 29. But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Again, he's not just talking about the recent years. He's not just talking about a sudden rise in adultery in Israel. He's not just talking about, you know, a sudden uh, escalation of evil activities and behaviors in all of Israel. He's referring again to this broad picture, an evil and adulterous. Listen, adultery is in spiritual relationship is identified throughout the Old Testament by a bunch of the prophets. Yeah. They all talk about, you know, of course, Hosea's situation is the, is the most pronounced, but they all talk about how they have committed adultery against, against their God. See? So he's saying an evil and adulterous generation. These were words that were familiar to this Judean audience. They had heard, they, had, they, were, they were well aware of the, of the fact that the prophets had pronounced them adulterers in their relationship with God. See? <clears throat> An evil and adulterous generation. There's that word again. All right, go down to verses 41 and 42. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation. Notice those words, the judgment, not a judgment, the judgment with this generation, right? We're going to need that for next week, okay? Because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed greater than Solomon is here. Well, see, so get this? But notice again, this generation. 
What are we doing? We are, <laughs> we are identifying the target audience of Jesus' words. Words that have been relocated in recent eschatologies, and by recent I mean the last few hundred years, words that have been relocated and misapplied and, and, t- and spoken as though they were to apply to you. That the queen of Sheba, or what it well, was, queen of the south, okay, she, she, will, she will rise up in the judgment with you. When you're judged, she'll be there. And she'll condemn you because she repented, see? You hear what I'm saying? And now I know you're familiar with this kind of thing because we've had this kind of treatment of Jesus' words throughout our upbringing, haven't we? We've heard these things, but until we actually come to the point where we can identify the the audience of Jesus, his vision concerning his ministry, the idea that he had. He said, my words are intended not for the Gentiles, not for the nations. Hey, you're the Gentile nations. I mean, that's who we've come from. We're not Gentiles because we're not pagans. But I mean, that's where we've come from, the Gentile nations, right? He said, my words aren't for them. My words are for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This generation, see, And he's made it clear, and he makes it even clearer as we go here. He's making it clear that this generation is a generation that encompasses everything from the fall of man as recorded in Genesis to his appearance. Right? Okay. Matthew 12, 45. A few more down there. Then he goes and takes with him seven. Well, let's just go down. Last line. So it shall be. So it shall also be with this wicked generation. Now, I should be taking probably the time to read all of these verses because you'll see in these verses how many things have been, have been thrust out, cast out many times as though they belonged to you. I mean, this verse here, you know, he goes out, takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first, so it shall be with this wicked generation. And so we have demonologies that have grown up. Anybody hearing me? See what I'm saying? So as I said, we're picking up some other things along the way, but that's really not what we want to go into today. Uh, some, of that, some of this that we're seeing will come out next, you know, in the next few weeks. So, but he says, this wicked generation. Or we could just say this generation, right? So again, <laughs> this generation is a summation of humanity back to its co- uh, origin. It's not the accusation of a particular group within a 40-year range. Say. In other words, it's heredity, not behavior, one more time, that he's talking about. All right, Matthew 17, 17. And this is also in Mark 9, 19 and Luke 9, 41. Here he refers to a faithless and perverse generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. O faithless and perverse generation. Okay. Matthew 23, 33. Here's a good one. Serpents. Brood of vipers. See? Serpents. Now listen, you've got to keep in mind that when Jesus speaks this, see, these people hear the association that he's making with their Genesis story. These are the people that wrote the Genesis story. These are the people that are, these people are more familiar with the Genesis story than you are because it's been the oral tradition before it was ever put in writing, you know, in 500 AD or whatever, or 500 BC. It was the oral tradition down through the years. The story of Genesis and what? The serpent. So when he says serpents and then says brood of vipers, he's he's adding a double whammy. (laughs) See what I'm saying? So I want you to hear that in this. When Jesus says serpents, he's not trying to be ugly. He's trying to draw their attention to their roots. He's trying to bring them. He's not screaming serpents like, you know, like we might call somebody a a, a bad name or something like that, you know. He's just saying serpents. Do you get the point he's saying? I'm speaking, you know, to mankind from the origin of your issue. To now, you are but a brood, but the offspring of vipers, the offspring of the serpent-inspired fathers of your natural generation in nature, right? 
this generation. Wow. Okay. And then look what he says. He says, how can you escape? He says here, the condemnation of hell. This is the word Gehenna. We're not going to get into this right now too much, but Gehenna and hell, there's been too much, too much. Let's make them all one word so it's easier to read. We'll take Sheol and Hades and Gehenna and Lake of Fire and Tartarus and, and, and all of the words that are used to identify completely different situations throughout the Old and New Testament, and we will call them all hell, make it easier to read. It's just a four-letter word. A lot easier to write hell than Gehenna. It's easier to remember hell than Hades because people have been telling you to go there all your life, right, when they weren't happy with you. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, the condemnation of Gehenna is no different than the condemnation that you and I experience today. See? So he says, how can you escape condemnation of Gehenna? And this question that he's asked here, how can you escape condemnation, wasn't intended, again, to simply, you know, further their self-condemnation, you know, and their shame, but rather this question was intended to point them to the answer. How can you escape? Because in the next verse, he starts out like this. Well, if I was in the right chapter, I'd know. Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Therefore, I. What's he saying to them? I'm God. Therefore, I send. How can you escape, you see, the condemnation of Gehenna? I send. Right? He said, therefore, I send. So he's saying, <laughs> he's saying, me, I'm your escape from condemnation. He's saying, I'm your redemption from the Gehenna of condemnation. Maybe this will help. Let me, let, let me uh, listen to this as Paul reframes this same question. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? How can I escape the condemnation of Gehenna? Right? Oh, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, I send. Hear this? How can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, I sinned. Paul says, you know, oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is therefore now no condemnation. Amen. Right? Now you say, yeah, but Mike, I know what that goes on to say. It goes on to say, for those who walk not in the flesh, but walk after the spirit. Absolutely, because you see the condemnation he's referring to here is not a condemnation of being cast into hell. It's a condemnation that is a self-rising condemnation when you walk in the flesh. He said you walk in the spirit. When, what is it? walking in the spirit? It means you walk in the revelation of what Jesus Christ has accomplished for you. And you walk without that, you know, free of that sin consciousness. You walk free of that condemnation and that guilt. Because you see that guilt that sense of guilt that we carry around with us all the time is the condemnation of Gehenna. That's what keeps us from being able to enjoy the benefit and the life of the love and the love and the grace of God. See what I'm saying? So Paul just reframed the question for us. He brought us a little bit of modern day needed clarity, I think, to it. But that's what Jesus was asking. How can you escape? I'll tell you how. Me. I'm your redemption. I'm your escape from condemnation. That's what he was saying, right? Okay. But I, I don't want to get into, I mean, I went a little further than I wanted to go on that. But anyway, I, I don't want to get lost in the details of each one of these references now. Because like I said, some of them we're going to touch on in greater detail later on. But, but what are we doing now? We're locating the target audience of Jesus' words. We're locating the lot that Jesus' words were to be built upon. We're identifying the neighborhood and the, and the, and the lot. And if the house was moved, it wasn't moved with his permission. It was moved without his permission. See? And that's what we're trying to do is identify this and be sure of it, confident of it before we go forward. Okay? Okay, we're still in Matthew 23, going on to verse 36. Assuredly, I say to you, now this is a good one. And again, you, you're going to want to go back and read some of the things before this. And I am going to deal with some of the things before this. But all I really want to do is keep you focused for a little bit here. Assuredly, I say to you, all, everybody say all, all, all these things will come to pass upon this generation. Hmm. All these things will come to pass upon this generation. That's interesting. Wow. Hmm. All these things are going to come upon who? Well, 
those <laughs> whose generation or, origina- or origination was of the serpent. That's what he's talking about. All these things will come upon those who were generated, see, who are the brood of vipers, who are the offspring, you know, of, of the serpent-inspired fathers of their nature. That's what he's talking about, right? Or well, again, we would say Adamic humanity, the generation from, from biblical Adam to the incarnation. That's what he's talking about here. All these things will come upon this generation. What did I say? All these things? Well, we got to see, and all the things that Jesus had said would come upon that generation. Who was Jesus talking to? The lost sheep of the house of Israel. He said, this generation, not the previous 40 years, not up to, you know, not, 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 not just the last 40 years of, 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 of your existence here in Israel. He's talking about this generation, all those who were generated initially from Adam. Boom. All these things. Mark 8, 12. Now, we'll get, now we have to jump over into Mark a little bit because there's a couple of them here that even though they sound familiar, some of them they weren't. They were different opportunities. Mark 8, 12. But he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? As assuredly, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. So once again, we see this generation referred to twice. I know you're probably getting tired of this, but you know what? It's good for you. 838. For whoever is ashamed of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And if you haven't heard that one at an altar, if you haven't heard that one when, uh, you know, when, when you were offered the opportunity to come forth and confess him publicly lest he deny you before God, right? If you haven't heard this one, then you must be brand new to church this week. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Now, we're going to save the last part of this verse for next week, the part when he comes in glory, because that's part of our our wrap-up of this particular thing that I'm talking about now. This adulterous and sinful generation. So once again, we have this generation. Go over to Luke chapter 11. Verses 50 and 51. The blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah who perished between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. Notice that it refers here to the foundation of the world. From the foundation of the world, verse 50, may be required of this generation. Chapter 17 and verse 25. I know you're getting the point by now. But he must first suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Hmm. Luke 21, 32. Now, I'm going to read this one. This is also from Matthew 24, 34 and Mark 13, 30. Matthew 21, 32. Assuredly, I say to you. I like it when Jesus says assuredly. That means you can bank on it. All right. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. In other words, what he's saying is the only way that this generation that I'm referring to is going to pass away is that by all these things taking place. By all what things taking place? Judgment, the wrath to come, vengeance. Keep in mind, you have a different understanding of judgment, wrath, and and, and vengeance. So Jesus wasn't forecasting the judgment, the wrath, and the vengeance that you've heard was going to come upon this generation. Again, he was saying something that our mythological interpretive skills have twisted and distorted. Jesus was offering them good news. Jesus always offered good news. When he said, assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. That was good news. He was saying, all of this garbage from this generation will be resolved. See? That's what he's talking about. I can say, you'll have to come back next week. So in other words, he's saying, you know, so, but, but again, this is Luke 21. And so this means that we have to read Matthew 24 and Mark 13 in the exact same light. And that is this, that the generation of whom he spoke, 
which I think we've already established, the generation of whom he spoke was the generation within which the wrath to come, that John talked about, would be manifest. The righteous judgment of God would be made known and the vengeance of God that we've talked about would be displayed. All of these things would be fulfilled or take place. They say fulfilled in one of the other Matthew or Mark. Okay. Now, why am I doing this? I'll tell you why I'm doing this because I know it gets a little tedious and a little, you know, well, okay, we've seen it. We're convinced, but here's the thing. You know, sometimes we miss an important emphasis simply because the references are scattered out throughout the scriptures. There's enough distance between them that we just don't make the connection. We read it here. It's three weeks before my devotions take me to Mark, you know, or take me to another place in Matthew where I run, stumble across this phrase again, this generation. By the time I, you know, have read all of the references to this generation, you know, I've, I've aged 12 years. And so I haven't made any real headway in putting these things together. So the reason I'm doing this all in one setting is because, you know, when we see them all together, lights begin to come on where illumination is very much needed. And that's what I think is happening. I think today you're seeing something about the generation in which Jesus prophesied all things would be fulfilled. All of those things, right? Now, and it's significant that in all this repetition, we see that these writers themselves seem to be equally inspired <laughs> you know, to emphasize the generation of Jesus as the generation of all these things. As the generation of judgment, the wrath to come, the vengeance of God. And as I said, now remember, Jesus was the wrath to come. When, when John talked about who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, John had a retributive mindset. You can tell that by fleeing from. But now we understand when we realize that Jesus was the wrath of God revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. As he was a restorative justice. Now we realize that John should have said, who has, who has invited you to, to come to the wrath to come? So he just had a backwards idea of it because he had a wrong perception. Isn't that right? Okay. <clears throat> So I said, you, you keep going back, you know, as we talk about these things, try to make your mind keep going back and grabbing on to your new understanding, your new perspective of judgment and, ju and, and, and wrath and, and vengeance, realizing that they don't mean what you thought they meant, right? And, and again, realizing, that genera realizing generation not in the limited sense, you know, that we usually consider it, but in light of a people that were generated in a serpentine fallen nature. And then we just got a couple things. I'm going to read this to you. You don't need to go there. John 8, 44 again. I want you to remember this. Where was I it? right here, wasn't it? He was a murderer from the beginning. So even in John 8, 44, Jesus is identifying their attachment to something from the beginning. The days, the days in which he spoke, the actual calendar days in which he spoke, uh, were significant, but they were not so significant as to detach these people from the beginning. That's what Jesus was saying. You've been his, your generation, see, has been from him from the beginning, right? Now, let's go to Acts chapter 8 and verse 32. And there's, we're going to see something beautiful here. Now, this passage I'm going to read you as, Phil, as Philip talks to the Ethiopian eunuch. This passage is straight out of Isaiah chapter 53, verses 7 and 8. <clears throat> the, place in the, uh, the place in the scripture which he read, the Ethiopian eunuch, was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before his shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. In other words, Jesus wasn't given justice, obviously. And then it says, and who will declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth. Now, in the aftermath, now we've seen all these passages that we've been looking at about this wicked generation, this evil and adulterous generation, this faithless and perverse generation, this generation, this generation, this generation. See, all those coming out of the words of Jesus' mouth. But now in the aftermath of Jesus' resurrection, we find a fresh designation. His generation. Who will declare his generation? Who will declare that they have been generated by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead? Who will declare that we now live in a different generation? Amen. That the generations, you get it? Yeah, I got it. Isn't that right? Yeah. 
So it's no longer Adam's. It's no longer a brood of vipers. It's his generation that has now been declared. Who will declare it? See? So that would again imply, as we've already seen in previous weeks, that who will declare his generation? Who will declare Jesus as having been fully the righteous judgment of God? Who will declare Jesus the wrath of God revealed from heaven? Who will declare Jesus the vengeance of God? Or what does that really mean? The vindication of humanity. Yes. Who will declare his generation? The declaration has been <laughs> of the generation of Adam. The declaration has been of, the, of, the, of the, ge the, the generation of the serpent. Isn't that right? But who will declare his generation? And then Peter says this in 1 Peter 2.9. You are a chosen generation. Yep. And the word chosen here implies favor. Or what? Grace. Right? You are a favored generation. And the word Greek here for, in the, for this word generation means born of this age. So he's saying you are a grace born, excuse me, a grace born generation. You are a generation born of grace. Amen. You are. See? Not a select few. You are a generation born of grace. There was this generation prior to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but now there is his generation to be declared. All right? So Peter declares that. He goes on. He says, you are a grace-born generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. See, in light of the understanding that we've accumulated today, you know, humanity has a two-generation history. And distinction is being made between the past evil wicked generation and the resurrection generation that's called out of darkness into light. And, and Paul goes on like this, giving thanks to the Father, Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, 13, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Who is the us? Well, as I've told you before, and you'll see it in just a moment, Paul always used the universal us. The Father has qualified us. The Father has qualified all men to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us. Who did he deliver? All of us. Yes. Right? You're not, just you're not delivered just because you've acknowledged it. You, it was his work that delivered you, not anything that you do. Absolutely. All right? He has delivered us, all of us, from the power of darkness and conveyed us. Who? The same us that were delivered. Into the kingdom of the son of his love. See, there is one kingdom on earth, ladies and gentlemen, his. Yes. There is one king, Jesus. That's what Jesus as Lord meant throughout the first century church. There is no king but Jesus. No king but Jesus. Caesar is not king. There is no king but Jesus. There is no kingdom but the kingdom of heaven on earth. Everything else is a counterfeit kingdom. Everyone else is a counterfeit king. Because there is only one true king, see? And he has conveyed us. Who? The same us that he delivered. Isn't that interesting? Right? So next week we'll use what we've learned today. Did you get anything out of that at all? Yes. Really? Yes. Next week, we're going to take this stuff, because like I said, it was intended to be primarily just set up. But there were some good things in it. There were some things that excited me when the Lord began to show this to me a few weeks ago. And, uh, and, and, I, and I began to see the reality of it and how it applied. But I was using this primarily for setup today. But there were some things in there we stumbled across, you know, you know when, when he comes with his holy angels, when he comes in the glory of the Father with his holy angels. Those are things that have been misused. So we're going to bring those things, you know, so that some of these troublesome scriptures uh, will, will again have the opportunity to fade away. Father, we